All right. Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Let me look at that camera. Welcome everyone. Join us online and outdoor in our courtyard. Come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Yeah. Okay. Who's rooting for the Chiefs? Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Who's rooting for the Eagles? Let me hear you. Yeah. I'm going to start preaching over here then. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love you. We're at Jesus first, and then, you know, there's a way down here. Is a, I'm excited, man. And then, honestly, Super Bowl, I, I am. It's great, but that's awesome. It's going to happen. But every Sunday is a Super Bowl here at Discovery Church, man. I am stoked about what God has been doing in this series, Red Flags. And, and today specifically, man, I believe there's a lot of healing that God's going to release today. There's, uh, there's some things that, that maybe we already know are there or maybe that God's going to bring revelation to uh, maybe even we've tried to address some things, but, but I think that there is a, a, a power that's being released, an anointing that's being released today for, um, for healing in areas that, that maybe we've become accustomed to. Maybe we, we've had conversations about and it just made it worse, uh, but today in Jesus' name, I'm praying for breakthrough in our homes, in our marriage specifically. Let me give you this verse, Proverbs chapter 27. We're in this red flag series. It's a relationship series. Yeah, there's a lot of verses we could talk about when coming to red flags, you know, those danger signs, potential ahead kind of thing. Proverbs 27, 12 says, the wise see danger and they avoid it. And that's what we want. We want to be wise in our relationships. We want to just uh, pay attention to the red flags, stop overlooking it, stop avoiding it, avoiding it, and have the conversations that we need to have because fools keep going and continue to get in trouble, in, in which that probably is, is a lot like a lot of our our homes and our conversations, we have the same arguments and the same dysfunction, and the same toxic stuff, and it's just like, like it's the same things. We're just dealing with and dealing with and dealing with. And the Bible says, man, that's, that is foolish that you're not seeing the signs and the danger that you keep walking into the same argument, the same pattern, the same dysfunction, and I believe it's time to be broken in Jesus' name. So I got for you today 21 red flags in marriage, 21. Red flags in marriage. Now in this series, it's been a relationship series. We started off with red flags and friends, red flags in, in our friendships, red flags in dating last week. And a lot of them can be used everywhere because like, all of it's relationships. So a lot of the flags for dating and for friendship can be used in marriage. So I'm trying to, I, I didn't want to repeat a lot of it. So I'm going to give you a lot of new flags specifically for your marriage, but I also didn't want to just dump all these red flags on you and have you leave here bleeding. You know what I mean? And you guys just like bleed on each other like, we suck. What are we going to do? And it's all your fault. No, it's all your fault. So what I want to do is like not just show you like maybe uncover some red flags. And like I said, some of it, you know, some of it maybe God needs to shed some light on. Um, but I want to as well give you the, the communication, like the, the five uh, components of a, of a successful communication in marriage. Like, how can we actually talk about this and address things, these things that we know are happening or that God revealed to us in a healthy way, in a way that is life-giving, in a way that at the end of this brings us closer together, that we actually can heal from some of this stuff. So I'm going to fly through a lot of these red flags just so that we can get to that place, but let me kind of set it up like I've done every week because we have to have the proper context of these relationships, make sure that it is, it's, it's the biblical framework and the God framework of, of these relationships. Let me start off with this question. Are great marriages even possible today? Is that possible? I think there's a, a lot of you are like, yeah, yeah, that is, but, but I understand the cynicism of a lot of people's approach to marriage because there's been so much hurt, there's been so much fallout and Maybe even that, that you, you experience as children. You know, you saw your parents and you saw your grandparents and now you've seen some things yourself. And so I understand the, the cynicism. I, I, you know, one guy said, you know what, I'm done. I'm done with marriage. I'm, just, I, I'm cool with me and my dog. I'm just done with the relationships entirely. And so he, he said, I, I, I can, you know how you can tell like, like who loves you more is, is between your dog and your, and your wife. Lock them both in a trunk and leave them there for one hour. And then come back and let, let them both out. See which one's happy to see you. You know, you know who's, who's really for you. I'm just kidding. Don't be, that was not an actual application point for you today, okay? But I get it. And, but I'd submit to you that great marriages are possible if done God's way. But they're not probable if you continue to do it the world's way. So it's important that we understand the biblical framework of what we're talking about here. When we talk about marriage, 
and addressing some of these things that we have the right understanding, the right mindset. So, so let me, let's go to the scripture. Let me set up where we're going today with red flags. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus to test him. So that's what they were doing. It was like they were trying to trap him, which they often did. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Which it was in their day. They had no-fault divorce like we have. We have no-fault divorce now. That's actually fairly new in our country, no-fault divorce, meaning like you just get a divorce. In 1969, that was first enacted into law in California. And then like throughout the 70s, that was the 1980s, started to, you know, uh, the rest of America you know, uh, is allowed to do no fault. You should not get to be able to get divorced without probable cause. So this still as a nation, this is something fairly new. And so in this culture, women were treated as property and men would have this certificate of divorce. They, they would keep it on them as a way to threaten. The, the, like they could rip it at any moment. It's no fault. They could rip it and this marriage is, is done and done with. So he says, can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? So sometimes the men in that culture, and they still, some of them still do this, they'll keep it on them and they'll even let it be poking out of their pocket. So the woman can see. You get out of line with, ah, they'll pull it out of that pocket. What'd you say? Yeah. Huh, some of you are like, this sounds like this could solve a lot of my problems. I'm just, I see you. I see you. This is not healthy, people. So look, he says, haven't you read that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh. Now, that's, that, that's not like symbolic, you know. It, there's a very deep spiritual soul connection that happens that creates a unity, a oneness. It's been compared to like if you have two pieces of paper that have the lines on it, you know, like the blue lines, college roll paper, and you glue them together. And you leave it there for a month glued together. And then you try to unone what you made one. You can't do it without tearing. The paper rips and tears and damage. And it's ugly. And some of you have experienced that pain. Some of you, if you're single today, because of maybe a failed marriage where the red flags were there, you couldn't address it, didn't address it, for whatever reason, you're not married anymore. I want you to know there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. Okay? But what God wants us to do is to learn from the mistakes of our past, our relationship decisions, how, and he wants you to become a better man, a better woman. Amen, somebody? Okay, okay, so then he says, so they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined, who joins them together? God joins them. Marriage is not an institution of civil authority. It is an institution of God, okay? What God has joined together, let no one separate. So he's saying, just don't think it's that easy. You can't un one, but Jesus isn't going, because that's the rule. No, he's going, What's well, no, you can't do that. Not because it's, that's the rule. You can't. He's going, it's just not as easy as you think, man. There's going to be, you're going to rip, you're going to tear, you're going to cause a lot of pain. Uh, and the, the bond that's there isn't, isn't like just to create damage when it's separating. The bond was intended to be there so strong that this, there would be a level of intimacy and unity and connection at a deep soul level that no other human relationship would be able to have this oneness, this supernatural spiritual tie, then a husband and wife joined together under God. So what do we do about that? We need to understand God's way. Before we get into the red flags, we got to understand that marriage is a covenant, not a contract. It's, it's a covenant. What God has joined together. I mean, contracts are good when you're buying a car, you know, buying a house or something. You got this big old list of stuff you sign because, and you're trying to protect your interests and your property. And because and, and, if you don't do this, and if you're going to do that, and then if you're not going to do that, then I get my money back. And I'm giving, I got to protect my stuff. Write it down like this. A contract is based on mutual distrust. That's why there's a contract. So, so that's why there's a lot of pages there. And that's why in marriages, some of you do things like prenups because, yeah, till death do us part. But if you ever start acting crazy, you ain't taking my stuff. You ain't taking my stuff. So we got, hey, we got to contract this thing out. I'm going to protect my rights and protect my interests, protect my stuff. And let's make sure. And that's what contract is based on mutual distrust. It's good for business, bad for marriage. Okay? But a covenant, a covenant is based on mutual commitment. Now, a lot of people say they're committed, but it's not commitment if there's a line in the sand if you got a way out you know so you're saying i'm committed to you as long as everything works out great but the moment it's not working out great i mean i'm not committed anymore 
Well, that's not commitment then. It was never commitment if you had that way out. Commitment means being willing to be unhappy for a while while we work this out. Let me say that again. That's important. Commitment means we're, I'm, be, I'm willing to be unhappy for a while while we figure this out and work this out. You don't need commitment on the good days. You need commitment on the bad days. That's why there is a commitment. It's for those bad days. That's why there's a covenant. It's for when it does get bad and when it does get hard. So if you have any of these red flags that are happening and you see them, I don't want you to be like, oh, that's it then, man. We, we don't. No, I'm going to help you. I just want to, I want to provide, hopefully the Holy Spirit can just give the, the revelation, the room, and the anointing today for you to have a conversation about some of this stuff and, and even give you the tools of how to have that conversation. So let's look at it. 21, how many are ready? 21 red flags in marriage. You ready? Okay, number one, number one, it's a red flag if there's a lack of emotional intimacy, like emotional connection and sharing where there is distance or isolation or maybe walking on eggshells around the other person. Maybe one person just, that was not their upbringing. You just don't share those things. You don't share hurts and dreams and pains and failures and feelings. And you don't share your day. I don't share my work day with you. You know, if I, you know, the, or maybe on the other end, maybe there's, you've tried to, and it didn't go well. So there's not, you can't be vulnerable. You feel like you can't be. There, there's not the safety to be emotionally vulnerable and to share because they've kind of used that against you a little bit. So when there is that kind of disconnection and, and distance and loneliness, that's, I'm telling you, that will grind down the relationship and is, and is destructive. It can, it, no, no marriage will last if there's not emotional intimacy and connection. And it can lead to the second thing, number two, red flag, if there hasn't been physical intimacy in a long time. Now, I'm not going to tell you how long of a time it needs to be. That's up to you to have the conversation about. I was talking to one guy after the service. He's like, I like to think of it like devotion. If you miss one day, you shouldn't miss two. That's how long like, I think it should be. I need every other day. Now, that's up to you, bro. You have that conversation. But, so I'm not going to tell you how often. But there, that's a red flag if, there's like, if there is a long time without you being physically intimate with your spouse. I did a whole message on this. If this is something that you guys, maybe you and your spouse, or you'd like to watch um, it's in February of 2021. Go look on YouTube. Go look on our history. I did a message called Best Sex Ever, okay? And so we talked. It's in the Bible. It's, it's all biblical, I promise you, okay? God created sex, and he created it to be such a beautiful thing in the, in, in, for a man and woman who are married. So that's a red flag, though, if, we can't, if we're not coming together and satisfying each other's needs physically, okay? Number three, they stop apologizing for bad behavior, they just get to a place where it's like, I am who I am. You marry me is what you get, you know? You know, that's it. That's, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not going to change. This is who I am. So when, when, when a partner gets to a place where they're no longer growth-oriented, they're no longer thinking, they think of themselves in a very static. This is who I am. These are my habits. These are my thoughts. This is how I talk. This is how I have friends. This is, this is what, you, what you get. It's, a, it's such a destructive place to get at where you're no longer thinking growth-oriented or taking any ownership for the bad behavior that you have. Number four. It's a red flag if you don't share passwords or bank accounts. Okay, I touched something there. Let's lean in. Let's lean in. So here, there needs to be a healthy level of accountability in a re relationship. If you are one, if you are one flesh, why are you having secrets? Why are you, why are you withholding passwords if you are one? In, why, why do you have your separate bank account where, where he can't see anything or she can't see anything? This is, this is I, I encourage people in our pre-marriage process here at Discovery, I know maybe your, I don't know, your background, your family, or uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why people make this decision, but I don't think, I don't encourage it. I think it's unhealthy. There's room for the enemy. She needs to be able to see anything at any time, Okay. Bank accounts, passwords, and everything. There needs to be. It needs to, I'm not saying you dig in every day and like, ah, ah, let me see what you got. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's some. That's a different flag. We'll get to. Okay, but there needs. You need to be that. Here I am. I'm an open book, and and we are one together. So I'm seeing a lot of stairs like this. Okay, I'm just giving you some stuff to talk about, y'all. Okay, number five, where there's excessive jealousy or controlling behavior. 
Now, jealousy will lead to controlling behavior where there's constantly texting and calling when you're separate. And not because you love them and you want to tell them something. You're like, who are you with? Who are you around? Or you FaceTime them. Not to see their face. You want to see everyone else's faces around them. You're like, you're like turn the camera around. And so he's got to pretend he's talking, like, hey, baby, this is where I'm at, hi. Yeah. <laughs> so that this, that's excessive, jealous, controlling behavior that I'll get more into as we, as we continue this. Um, where am I at? Number nine? Number, number six? I'm skipping three already? Okay, number six. Okay, unhealthy, red flag, unhealthy boundaries with the opposite sex. Okay, where there's, you know, look, she's just my, she's my friend. She's my friend, you know, and I, and, and so we talk, we chat, you know, we, we've just been friends for a long time. He's my, he's my only sane coworker. Everyone's crazy. Oh my gosh, we just connect because, you know, it's just lunch. It's just a lunch. And just, no one else to really hang out with. It's just coffee. And th- look, this is a red flag if you have not talked about boundaries with the opposite sex in your marriage. This is something that you need to have a conversation about if you haven't had the conversation. So we have, Veronica and I have boundaries. We actually have boundaries for our staff as well. Even when that's on staff, as a pastor or not, here at Discovery Church, there are boundaries, man. You cannot, if you are married, you cannot get in a, in a car alone with another woman. You cannot take a drive. And I don't care if we're all going to the same place and you're getting in the car and we're carpooling. You don't get into a car with another woman if you're married, okay? You don't have lunch or coffee with another woman alone if you're married. You're going to sit down at the table and have a call. I don't care if you're the leader. You better, you better figure out something and have someone else there or do it in a different place. You ain't going out that way. Okay? We're not alone with the opposite sex in the office, which can be a little bit um, disruptive to the day in your schedule. I remember just this last week, I was in the office and I was going to stay all day because I'm prepping for a leadership class I, I do at 6.30 and I'm there and everyone starts leaving and I noticed that there's one of our female staff members that's going to be left there. And, and, and I don't tell her anything. I'm just like, okay, well, that's it. I'm packing up. You know, I gotta, I'm leaving. I gotta, and, and yes, it's a little bit inconvenient. Now I got 20 more minutes out of my day. I'm only spending there 45 minutes and I'm coming back, but I am not going to stay in the office alone with the opposite sex. And, and before you go, well, Pastor Jason got a problem here. They must got some problems in there. <laughs> this is, this is a, a healthy boundary that we have created that we want to be a good model to the other couples and marriages and pastors that there needs to be boundaries with the opposite sex. Have a conversation, you guys. Number seven, you argue over who's right and wrong. Okay, I talked about this a little bit in one of our messages where you're, you're not fighting fair, right? You're, you're not fighting for restoration. You're fighting, for, you're fighting to win. So, so you think of it like a line, like if there's a line drawn in the sand, we're like, you, like, I'm right, you're wrong. Like, of course I'm right. I even have the receipts. Here the, look, this is, don't you see? I got the scriptures to prove it too. Here these, like, I'm right, you're, come on this side. Anytime you draw a line and you create right versus wrong, you do damage to the oneness that God has created you for. You're separating, you're unwanting what's been made one. How you handle something, a disagreement, a difference of opinion, a, a, a whatever, right? How you handle that is so important. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But here's what, really quickly, instead of drawing a line and putting yourself on one side, step outside of the problem, grab your spouse together and say, honey, here's the situation. Which side are we going to go on the line? Are we going right or left? Here, let's talk about this. Let's talk about why here, why here? Let's talk about this. And we're going to land somewhere together. We're gonna, and even if we land on separate sides, we're doing that together. Okay, well, I understand what you're thinking, and you understand what I'm thinking. Okay, that's okay. We can do disagree to disagree. This isn't a make or break. Conversations, you guys. Uh, right and wrong. Number eight. It's a red flag if you use words with the intention to hurt or devalue. Relationships can get to this place really quickly, can ex- escalate really quickly, where... You know, hurt people hurt people. So when I'm hurt in the relationship and I'm not feeling valued, I'm not feeling respected, um, I just want to, you know, 
I want to hurt them back, so I take a little jab. I make a little comment, you know, and I really want to see them flinch. I want to see them cry. I want to inflict pain like I'm, like I'm hurting. Maybe even afterwards you think, like, I didn't mean that. I really didn't mean that. I don't, I don't mean that what I said. I was just angry. I was just angry. I don't mean that. I love you, and I don't, I don't think you're crazy, <laughs> and I don't think you're an idiot. I don't think you're stupid. I don't think, and you have to go back and say, like, backtrack all these words. It is a, it's a dangerous place to be at in your marriage where, where you intentionally inflict wounds on each other and devalue each other. Number nine, they pick and choose certain scriptures that benefit them. They beat you with them. The spiritual abuse is a real thing in church and in in Christian marriages. I've had people come to me and Veronica, men come to me and go, go, you need to Veronica as well, you need to tell my wife to submit. She is not submitting in God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, and it's the only verse this fool knows in the whole Bible, is this (laughs) Ephesians chapter 5, submit. I'm like, it's really convenient for you to (laughs) memorize that one. Once you back up four verses where it says submit one to another. Or maybe go just a few more verses where where it actually says, uh, it explains the love of a husband. That's supposed to be Christ-like, sacrificial, going to the cross kind of love. So you can pick that one out, but can we have a conversation is when the last time you laid down your rights and what you wanted for her? When's the last time you didn't go out and you didn't watch what you want to watch, didn't do what you wanted to do? You just, you loved her that way and you, you sacrificed her. When was the last time, hey, let's back it up. When was the last time you, submit, yeah, she got to submit to you, got it. When was the last time you submitted to her? Can you even swallow that word down your gullet? Man of God, submit. Okay, this is a real thing where people like to take this as one verse out of context and, and prove each other. The word of God that was meant to heal and empower and restore was, was used and is used in, in destructive ways, not the intention that God designed it for. Red flag number 10. There are no boundaries this time between not the opposite sex, but between in-laws and friends, where we just don't talk about that. We don't, we don't talk about how much they're involved, how much they're speaking into. If you're a newlywed, do not move in or let your in-laws move in. It's not a good idea. In fact, don't even live on the same block, zip code. <laughs> Something just, just, uh, just leave and cleave, man. You got to have that conversation. And there are some friends, there are some friends that, that, that may, and again, where's the line here, Pastor? Tell me what's too much. No, I'm not going to. That, that's for you and your spouse to talk about, to figure out, to have the conversation in a life giving and healthy way of, of, hey, this one here, this friend, I just think that you're going out way too much and he's going on way too much. I feel like, like that's just too much for me. Can we talk about that? That just needs to be a conversation if that's a red flag for you. They pick and choose, or there are no boundaries between in laws or friends. Number 11. Uh, you prioritize time with kids over time with each other. This is so huge in our culture, you guys. And you need to know that your kids need to see you model a healthy marriage. They need that from you. They need to know that you, listen, that you prioritize your spouse over them. They need to see, like, inside of you and your relationship and your marriage, that, that there is a superior love and a priority relationship over your children. And this is something that culture, like, like maybe there's some of you say, no, man, that's my kids, man. He's dispendable. He can leave me. They'll never leave me. Here's what you need to know. If you are not modeling that kind of love, that a relationship between a spouse is superior and priority, then you are failing your responsibility as a godly person, as a godly husband or a godly wife. Okay? There are so many other responsibilities that culture has put on you. For your kids, responsibility after responsibility to where it's like stressful to be a parent nowadays. It's so high demand to be a parent. It's tiring. And it was never meant to be that way. It wasn't. It wasn't meant to be so hard. Parenting's so hard. Really? I mean, I get it. I, I have kids, and they can, they can hurt you and inflict wound like nobody else, but maybe, maybe you need to let them figure some stuff out and get out of the way. Maybe you need to let them fail a little bit. Maybe you need to just like, like, no, I'm not going to sign you up for another. Do the homework yourself. There's Google. I'm going on a date. You know? They come up in like your conversations. You just let them interrupt. You're like, one more time, I'm going to smack you in the mouth, okay? I'm talking to dad right now. Be quiet. (laughs) 
When's the last, like, you know, they, so you prioritize it. Whatever their needs are, whatever their needs are, whatever their needs are, whatever their needs are, that's a red flag. That is not, your, your relationship, so many Christian relationships in the home, it look, it's, it's more modeled after the world than the word of God. That's not the priority should not be to, now I'm not saying don't love your kids, love the kids, but what your kids absolutely need is to see a healthy, a healthy marriage. They need to see a prioritized love for each other. No wonder this generation does not want to get married. You know why? Because we didn't model it well for them. Okay, where are we at? Number 12? Number 12. Red flag. They don't have any friends. Yeah, if your partner doesn't have any friends of their own, this can be a red flag for a couple different reasons. Number one, maybe they are um, unable to maintain healthy friendships over a long period of time. Like they cycle through friends. Like every few years, they're just, it's new friends, new friends, and they're just cutting people off because they just don't know how to handle the tension, the challenges, the differences that are necessary to maintain a healthy relationship over a long period of time. Or maybe they're not unable, they're just unwilling. They just don't care. They don't have the empathy or the need. And this is, either way, it's a red flag because you need people. You do. You have, there, there's two kind of levels that are inside of, you know, your, your life that are operating and fluctuating. It's called the, it's the challenge level. Say challenge. And support level. Say support. Okay, so it's uh, fluctuating all throughout your life, depending on how much support or challenges you're facing. So when you're facing more challenges in life, like you got a promotion, you got more people you're overseeing, the world is crazy and getting crazier and demands and commitments and da 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 da. And so, like, your challenge is increasing. What happens often the time when our challenge, we're being more challenged, our support, we don't increase it, we actually decrease it. We tend to isolate ourselves, or because of the demands, we just kind of like, just like, let go of like the support, let go of the people, let go of the people we should be around, should be speaking to, should be opening it up to, should be inviting in. It's just like, I'm just too busy to go to that group thing. I just like, it's just too, and that's like, that's the sign that you actually need to be in the group and you need to be around people is when you can't afford or don't have the time to do it. Is like, it's no, that actually means you need it. Because the distance between your challenge level and your support level is called your stress load. Okay, and that stress load is the, is, is the reason why, in marriage, why adultery happens. It's why pornography happens. It's why addictions are present. It's why we backslide into the, it's because I need an outlet. I need support. And if I don't have healthy support mechanisms and people in my life, I'm going to reach for other things that are more quick and temporarily satisfying. You need, you need to have friends in your life. And if you don't, it's a red flag because marriage is challenging enough. Now we live amongst a crazy world and crazy times. And so we're going to have a stress load that you need to increase the support for. Make sense, you guys? Okay, red flag number 13. You just stop intentionally pursuing him or pursuing her. And, and the key word there is intentionally, right? Because you're around each other. You spend time. You sleep in the same bed. You use the same restroom. You, you kind of have meals and stuff. But there's just not intentional pursuit. Where, when's the last time you went on a date together? When's the last time you just, you, you know, you, I don't, you just intentionally did something together? You went on a vacation together without the kids. You spent the night in a hotel or something. Like, that's a red flag if you stop intentionally pursuing. Number 14, you constantly make decisions based on what your partner wants or needs and prioritize their needs over your own. Now, of course, that, that sounds like, well, that's sacrifice. That's any relationship needs that. But if it's constantly, that's codependency. That's the definition of codependency, where I'm constantly placing your needs, desires, and wants over mine, and I don't even think about mine. That is an unhealthy red flag in any relationship. Number 15 is where technology takes over your time and attention. So maybe you are going on dates. Maybe you do every week go on a date. Veronica and I go on a uh, date every week, intentionally every week. We go out probably a couple times every, every week, but intentionally a date every week. We have dinners together with the family intentionally multiple times throughout the, the week, but there's an intentional one where we do games as well. Um, some of you guys might be doing like a date and maybe even dinner time, but you're, on, you're all like this. You're like on the phone. 
and technology is taking over. Okay, how about this? Next time you go on a date, leave your phones in the car. Next time you're at the dinner table, like, don't bring your phone with you. It's a, and you, here's how you know if it's too much, if it's getting to be too much. If your spouse says, can you put that down? It's gotten too much. And I know every one of us have probably heard that, and we got defensive, right? That's your response. It's like, I don't I mean, I was just on, I was just doing this. I was just, I, you know, it's just been a few, you're on, wait till I saw you on your phone just earlier today. Come, no, 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 seriously, let's go, go, go to settings. Go to settings. Let's, let's measure. Come on. And then, and then you, you're like, well, it wasn't that much longer, you know? Okay, this is just a red flag if technology is constantly taking over time and attention. Number 16, they stop wanting to grow in their walk with God. This is a red flag that something is off in, in, in someone's heart, in someone's alignment with God, where, where attending church is just not a thing anymore. They're not passionate about pursuing God. Their devotion to God, their prayer time, small groups are serving. You know, you used to serve, and you get away from serving because that, that challenge level goes up and up and up, and they're just cutting things off, cutting things off, and they're just not pursuing Jesus anymore or growth anymore. That is a red flag. Something is off on the inside that will affect your marriage because marriage, when it comes, like a biblical marriage, is just not the unification of two people. It's the unification of three people. It's a husband and wife and God. It's a three-chord strand. Amen? Okay, number 17. You constantly settle for 50-50 to maintain peace. Now, 50-50 may sound right, right? It sounds good. It seems right, but it is profoundly dangerous. If you have half-hearted effort plus half-hearted commitment, you know what you get? Wholehearted disappointment. Okay, if you believe marriage is always 50-50, you know what you're going to do? You're going to continue to keep score. You're going to go, okay, no, no, last time you picked the restaurant. We did what you wanted last time. Hey, you, you, it was your movie last time, and you're just going to constantly keep score. But whenever, listen to me, whenever you keep score, everybody loses. Marriage is not supposed to be 50-50. It's supposed to be 100-100, okay? It's supposed to be one and one coming together to make one. Not I'll be happy 50% of the time, and I'll let you be happy 50 And then I can be miserable 50% of the time just for you, because I love you. No, that's not a healthy compromise there, okay? Number 18, it's a red flag when you refuse to get counseling and help. It's been talked about. You've promised it. You said, yes, we're going to do it, and you just don't. You don't want to get help even. You don't open up. It comes up, you have the opportunity in the group or with your team or with people, and you, got, you don't want to share with your leader, you don't want to share with your pastor, you don't, want to, you don't want to make the appointment, and this is a red flag when you just don't want to get, and you might say things like, but I'm committed, I'm never going to leave, I'm committed to this marriage. Here's the thing, like, I, I'm glad that you're committed to this institution, to the covenant of marriage, but that's like the... Con least common denominator is the marriage. Before you're committed to the marriage, you should be committed to the person. So I'm committed, yes, I'm committed to my marriage covenant with Veronica, but before and superior to that, I'm committed to Veronica. I'm committed to love her, to serve her, to honor her, to bless her. I'm committed to her, not just to the institution. If your marriage has got to that place where you're like, we're just committed to this marriage thing. I said I would and I'm going to stay to that. My goodness, we've gotten way too far here. You need, to, you need to take it up a few notches and not just commit to the marriage, but commit to her. Commit to him. Number 19. Are you guys getting this, you guys? All right. Uh, number 19. They're spiteful decisions or purchases. Spiteful. Now, I'm not just talking about, like, you hope he doesn't look at the credit card. You know what I mean? Like, oh, my gosh, I hope he doesn't see what I bought. That's a yellow flag. You know what I mean? It's not, not necessarily a red flag, I don't think. I'm talking about spiteful decisions where, where because you're not being satisfied or what the other person is doing and how they're going about things, you say, well, that's what he's going to do. Then I'm going to buy this myself. I'm just going to go ahead and, and no, I know he doesn't like it when I do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I know she don't like that. And if she, she's going to be like that, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to go for this. Okay, that's, that, that is a red flag if you are making spiteful. Decisions that are out of spite, trying to hurt, knowing that they don't want you to do it and you're going to spitefully do it anyway or spitefully purchase it anyway. Red flag number 20, you're threatening leaving, separating, or divorce. If it's gotten to that place, this, it's, this message is for you, man. You're here on purpose. You're here on purpose for a purpose. We, you know, get to this place where we threaten, leave. maybe you're, you, you pack it up, you start packing stuff or like that's it, I'm just, and you may even say like, maybe it's not going to work then, and it, and it just gets it, escalates to that point, well, maybe it's not going to work, you even may say divorce, and I hope, I hope today that, I want to challenge you, like, 
take it off the table, man. Stop threatening it. Stop using the word and, and, and recommit, re, re-up on your covenant commitment that you've, that you've made. Number 21, there's constant arguing and criticizing. It's just gotten where you don't even, it's not, you're not, it's not fun anymore. You're not happy anymore, and I get it. Constant arguing. Relationships are difficult. Marriage can be difficult, but the scripture is very clear that marriage is a blessing when it's a blessing. But marriage is a curse when it's a curse. When it's not a blessing, it's not a blessing. The scripture tells us as much. Look what it says in Proverbs 18, 21 and 22. And I think it's very intentional that, that the proverb 21 is right before 22. Look what it says. Death and life are in the power of the what? Oh, I'm going to help you out here, you guys, because, because this thing is getting you in trouble. It's not the fact that you just have problems. Everybody has problems. Every marriage has problems. Every relationship has problems. It's, it's you're making it worse with this thing. It's, it's how we're processing and communicating. It's not getting it to a healthy, restorative place, to a healing place. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who live it will eat its fruit. And then intentionally, here's what he says next. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And all the ladies said, and obtains favor from the Lord. I'm a blessing. Amen. Marriage is a blessing when it's a blessing. But marriage is not a blessing when it's not a blessing. Proverbs chapter 27, 15 gives us an example. A quarrelsome wife. Is as annoying as a constant dripping on a rainy day. Marriage is not a blessing when it's not a blessing. I mean, God intended it to be, but some obviously are, can get to a place where it is not a blessing. And so to be an equal gender offender and not just offend the women, <laughs> let, me, let me turn your attention to 1 Jason chapter 4, verse 9. <laughs> it's better to step into warm dog poop or pass a kidney stone than to marry a man who is a self-centered, narcissistic jerk. There you go. That's from the, uh, from the SBIB version. Should be in the Bible version right there, okay? All right, so what do we do? You guys, you guys see it. You guys, every marriage has growing opportunities. Maybe there's red flags that are already present. Maybe you've tried to address some of them. Maybe some of them you're like, whoa, we need to talk about that. We've never talked about that. What do we do? Well, let me help you give you the, the, the components of a healthy, like successful communication in marriage that today in Jesus' name is going to be the most healthy, life-giving, healing conversations that your marriage has ever had. In Jesus' name, like that's going to happen today. There's going to be anointing and grace for you to go to places in your marriage and in your conversation that you are not willing or able or had capacity to go. But today, in Jesus' name, there is a new level of anointing and grace that God is being released to heal your marriage. Okay, five, five components that we need to understand. They all begin with T, okay? Here's the first one. The first one is the right tone. We got to watch our tone when we're talking about these things, man, these difficult things, these red flags. We got to have the right tone. Tone is critically important to successful communication. So to give you an example, I'm going to say the same thing three different times, and it's going to mean three different things. Same thing. I'm going to say three different times. Here it is. Okay. I understand. I'll do it. Okay. I understand. I'll do it. Okay. I understand. I'll do it. The same thing that was said. Three totally different meanings. One was happy, one was frustrated, one was angry. Tone communicates care. So as you're talking about these things that, that need to be addressed, the red flags for a reason. Danger, danger. Okay? Stop just continuing going forward and getting in trouble. Talk about it, but watch your tone. You could be saying the right thing in the wrong way and totally mess it up and think it's their fault because they're wrong. No, your tone is wrong. Okay? So let's, it's this, death and life, death and life. It's not just that, that problem. Oh, we need to deal with that. No, 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 no. This thing, man, is either going to lead you to death or lead you to life today. The right tone. Number two, time. It's got to be the right time. Don't do it in the lobby. 
Don't do it in the car. Don't even do it in the car. Don't do it. Nothing, no, <laughs> no difficult conversation is good between like A to B. You need to see the right time and enough time. The right time and enough time. You want to make sure that you're making the time to address the challenges and the red flags. You know what the right time is? The best time to communicate is proactively. Proactive communication is the best communication. It's where you actually have it you know, scheduled. It's a rhythm. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk about what's this week. Hey, here's where we're going this week. Hey, we're, go- we're going to your mom's house. Can we-, can we talk about this? Can I get a safe word? You know what I mean? Can I... <laughs> Because, like, yeah, it's just, because it's going to be a thing, and we know it's going to be a thing. And, or, you know what, this is like, I'm going again to, to this thing. And last time we, I, went, I went to this event or went to this thing, there was a little bit of tension between, can we talk about how can we, how can we do that and do it? That proactive communication is, you are your best self, and you communicate the most graciously when you're communicating proactively. Okay? But if you don't do proactive communication, you're going to fall into reactive communication. In reactive communication, that's your worst self. You're not as gracious. You're not as patient when you're reacting instead of proactive. And by the way, when you have reactive communication, you are going to default to radioactive communication. There's going to be like nuclear fallout. There's going to be danger. It's going to be harm. It's going to happen if you stay in that zone of reactive communication. It'll eventually get radioactive, okay? So you're going to harm people if you don't move to the right time and enough time and proactively communicating some of these challenges that you know are there, you know you're going to do it, you're having the meeting, you're going to the trip, you're going, you know, whatever it is, you know it's there, proactive communication, healthy, successful communication, time, tone. Number three, trust. Trust, this atmosphere. I got to create an atmosphere of trust. There's got to be like this level of, you know, that, that we trust each other. We, we, we've talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 13 quite a bit over these last few weeks. Um, where in verse 7, it says, love always trusts. And that, that can be a hard thing for some of you to trust. And, it, and, and the reason it, it's, it's interesting to be in the love chapter is that l- trust, for a lot of you, it's like, well, that depends on them, not me. How am I going to trust? That's more dependent upon that person. But when you look in the Greek word, that word trust, it's, it's translated believes always. So this is what love does. You know what love does? Love assumes the best. Okay, we all have expectations. Every one of us have expectations. This is what I want, this is what I don't want. I want, I want this, I want that. And then, we, and then we have experiences that we, you know, what we do get, okay? But between your expectations and your experiences is this middle ground where you either are going to assume the best, uh, think the best, or assume the worst. And some of you assume the worst. Some of you, you, you go quickly to like, well, you must be cheating. She must be, she must be, this is why, this is why. And you go down this rabbit trail and you have this, this toxic communication. And it's just, it, you're, that's not love. Love always, always believes the best. Well, this is why he just thought, he just forgot. She just, you know, she just, you know, this is what happened. She got busy. That's what happened. He didn't mean to hurt me. He didn't mean, he's not cheating on me. You know what I mean? I'm just like, I'm going to assume the best. That's what love does. That's what you need. When you have this, this conversation, what you need to, to communicate is, I love you. I believe that you love me too. And I believe that we're going to work this out. And I believe that you're a good man. And I believe that you're a good woman. And I believe that you would never do anything. But I, I want to talk about something that I, I just, it was a little bit, it's, it's a little hurtful. Whatever it is, you got to create that atmosphere of trust. Number four is truth. Truth. The truth spoken in love, though, not just truth, beating each other with truth, truth, but the truth spoken in love, right? Ephesians 4 says, speak the truth in love, and we all grow. That's what happens when I speak the truth in love. Growth happens. So we're going to be truthful, but it's going to be done in love. And then number five is, is team. We're going to have this conversation um, in a team spirit. We're one. Again, I'm not going to stand on one side of the line and you put your idea and you on the other side of the line and say, I'm right, you're wrong, let's figure this. Come on over here. I'm not going over there. No, we're going to stand together because we're one and we're a team and we're going to put the problem or the red flag or the situation over there and we're going to deal with this together because we're a team. We are one flesh. It's a covenant relationship under God. I saw the power of this years ago when I was counseling a couple. I don't do a lot of counseling anymore because I suck at it. I'm not good. I don't have the acumen, the patience, you know, to have like that. Because I found out, like, because when I talk to people and I do counseling, I would see the problem in me. I'm like, yeah, I know what's, 
here's, here's what you got to do. But I figured out that people don't want the solution. They just want to talk about it. And I'm not good at that. Uh, and there's a, let me just say, like, there's a lot of other people on our team and other people that are just gifted with this, and I'm gifted in different ways. I add a lot of value to the body of Christ in different ways than, than, than counseling. But when I did do it, I was working with this couple for like four months, and there was, it was a challenging situation. Where the guy committed adultery. He cheated on his wife, and they were trying to see if they could work it out. He wanted to. She was thinking, if, you know, let's, let's see if we can. But after about four months, she came to me and said, I just can't. Done. She had scriptural grounds to, to divorce. She had scriptural grounds to leave him. But, but what I said to her, I said, I, okay, you know, you got scriptural grounds. I told her you got scriptural grounds to you, but I want you to, to know that this is probably going to be more painful than you realize. Okay, it's going to be a lot of pain to you, a lot of pain for your kids, and just take that into consideration outside the feelings of the moment. And I was trying to be very caring and pastoral. I didn't try to judge her or try to like make her feel like she was being wrong or anything like that. But she just took some time and came back. She said, no, I'm, I'm done. I just feel like like, this is time to move on. I said, okay. Hey, we're, I, I said, we're going to pray for you and your husband. We're going to continue to walk with you guys through this. We love you. Okay, but let's do this together, all right? We're going we're gonna to walk with you through this thing, man, and see God do something, bring something good out of this situation. As I was walking her out of the office, this was a long time ago, you guys. Um, as I was walking out of the office, she, she goes, well, hey, Pastor, do, you, do we have any, like, recovery support groups? And I said, yeah, we got this Celebrate Recovery, which we have it at this ministry, too, a Celebrate Recovery. And uh, I said, why? And she said, well, I got this brother, man. He's just, since his, you know, he's in his 30s, but his whole life, since he was in high school, he'd been strung out on drugs. I basically support him. He lives with me most of the time. I've given him money, bailed him out of jail. He's like, I've stolen stuff from my house and stuff like that. Just, he's always messing me over, but I just feel like if we had a support group for him, then we could really, he could get free. and We could help him out. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a second. I mean, I hear that, you know, there is like a whatever it takes kind of commitment that you have to your brother who's messed you over, just done, d- d- you know, betrayed you and hurt you. And yet there is like a whatever it takes commitment for him. But this other relationship we've been talking about seems disposable. What's the difference? And, and she said, well, pastor, he's my brother. He's blood. That's what she said. He's my brother. He's blood. And I said, oh, okay, I see. Here's, here's the problem. You didn't define this thing, this marriage, the way God defined it. You didn't see this, this marriage the way that God actually sees this marriage. Because it's like your relationship with your kids. Something like, like my kids, if they were to run off, they start making bad decisions, I would chase them to the ends of the world to rescue my kids. I'm not talking about enabling behavior. There comes a time where it's like, okay, you need to figure something out because my help now is hurting. That's wisdom, okay, to, to understand that. But I would, I would chase to the ends. Of the, I, would, I would, what is that movie, Liam Neeson movie, where you go and I will find you <laughs> and I will kill you. That, yeah, that one? Take it. That's what it is. I will straight kill someone. Did I say, take that off. Take that off. <laughs> Striking that. We're going to strike that one, okay? Someone's going to use that against me one day when I do kill someone. See, you said he'd do it. <laughs> we got all this commitment to our kids, but God's, I really think that God wants that same level of commitment to your spouse, that covenant relationship. Let, let me show it to you. Malachi chapter 2, verse 6. He says, so God says, so be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Why? Because that's the rule. No, that's not, that's not why. Watch this. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he was supposed to protect. So it was in that moment that God is going, wait, no, 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 no. Like in that moment, he's strung out. He's on drugs. He needs to get bailed out. He's even like betraying you. He's a, that, that's where God is going. That's why I gave you him as a sister. That's why you're there. But, but we need to understand, and we understand that in, like, in blood relationships, but you need to understand that that, that same Commitment, covenant should show up in our marriages. Some years ago, one of my kids made a big mistake. And I could have came down on them and punished them. and told them, Mike, you know better. What's the matter with you? And, but it was in that moment I felt like this was a defining moment for my child. And, and I, the way I approached it is, is I told them how much I love them. I said, I love you so much and I will never 
Nothing you can ever do can make me stop loving you. And I know right now you need my love and my presence in your life more than ever. And I want you to know I'm committed forever to you and we're going to get through this. That moment was so empowering for my child. And, and I, to be honest, I never felt more in love to my child than in that moment. I really felt like, like my heart was gravitated to them. I didn't want to push them away and go, darn you. I wanted to bring them close. That's what love does. Love doesn't give a person what they deserve. It gives a person what they need. So watch this next verse. He says, so be on your guard. Why? Because you're going to feel like bailing. Be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating you staying in an abusive relationship. By the way, we, we'll give advice too. Like, if there's abuse in certain things, like maybe there needs to be some separation for a season of healing and growth, and that may happen. But here's God saying, like, it was in the moment that love was supposed to show up that you did violence to the one. So what do we do? I think before you have these conversations later today, I want you to refresh your, your commitment, to refresh your covenant. I want three, three things, three things today, three commitments today to make before you have the conversation later. You need to empower your marriage with the ability to have those conversations. Without these commitments, you don't have the power. You don't have the capacity. You don't have the resources or the capital within your marriage to actually go there. You need to make three commitments today. Here they are, together, together. We will make the choice to love. We're going we're gonna, to, I love teaching this principle because too many people think love is a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love has feelings, but love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Love is, is, is sleeping, staying up all night next to your kid's bed, catching their throw up all night. I don't feel good. That's terrible. I hate that. But that's what love is. Love gets that bowl and empties it out real quick and comes back for the next projectile vomit coming out, okay? That's what love does. That's not a feeling. That's, that's love. Colossians 3.14, and over all these virtues, look what he says, put on love. I, I appreciate that he didn't say have love because you don't have love. You choose love. You put it on like it's a coat. Some of you, because, because of whatever has happened in, in the past and the hurts and, and the dysfunctions and all these things, you, you've just, you've chosen to leave love off. But what you need to know, listen, your choices need to lead you. Your feelings will follow. Choices lead, feelings follow. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I, I'm, I'm going to, honey, okay, we're going to choose this. We're going to, we're refreshing our commitment for the conversation that needs to be happening. We're going to choose love. I'm going to be willing to be unhappy for a while, while we figure this out. I'm going to choose love anyway. I'm going to love you through this. Got to make that commitment today before the conversation. Number two, we will prioritize this relationship. We're going to do that. That's a commitment we're going to make before the, the outcome of these conversations. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to love you before the outcome. I'm going to love you. I'm going to put it on. And I'm going to prioritize this relationship. Priority is so important. We talk about that a lot here at Discovery. I think it's such a, it's important in our relationship with God. But what you need to know as well, priority is, in, is important to your marriage as well. Like outside of every other human relationship, your marriage needs to be the priority. And other things are stealing time, stealing attention. We need to come back to this place. You know what, babe? You know what? We're going to make this thing a priority again. We're going to be intentional. Again, Galatians 6 says, Do not be deceived. God can't be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I love that. That means if you don't like what you're getting, look at what you're giving. Stop complaining about what it is not, what he's not, what she's not, what you don't have, and start sowing something different. Let us not become weary in doing good. You don't understand. He's just terrible. And she's just always this and always that. I, I, I get it. You just need to keep sowing. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. For in the proper time, you will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do not give up. Man, we're refreshing our commitment. It's what you need. This covenant 
this level of commitment, it's going to give you the power, the anointing, the grace you need to have the conversation you need to have. Without this, it doesn't work. Without the covenant, it doesn't work. Without God's standard of marriage, you don't have the power to succeed in it. I'm choosing to love you no matter what, and I'm going to prioritize this. I'm willing to be unhappy for a while while we figure this out, baby. And then this last one, I could put it at the end of every sermon, but I'd like to maybe for you to make it together. Like for this to be your, your re-covenant, your recommitment as we get ready to have some, some conversations. The most healing, the most important, the most life-giving conversations our marriage has ever had. Number three, honey, we're going we're gonna to trust God through this. We're going to trust God. I'm not going to put all my trust in you to fix it or I'm not going to fix it. We're not going to just, we don't have all the answers. Hey, here's what we're going to do. Together, we're going to trust God because Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, all of this is in vain. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.